Hello everybody, hope you're doing well and thanks for joining us for another video. Now, rather unsurprisingly, my videos receive a lot of comments these days from flat earthers, although rarely do they seem to say things related to the topic of that particular video. Usually it's bringing up unrelated topics uh, of things that they think debunks the globe. And judging by many of the comments, I get the impression that some people don't have a true sense of just how big the globe is or how small the things on it actually are. Now, I did a video a few months back addressing the vast scale of the universe, that if the Earth were the width of a human hair, the solar system would move about half a football pitch per year, and Polaris would be the size of a football about 9,000 miles away, which is why stars don't seem to change night after night. But that all makes the Earth sound quite small, when in reality it's not. So in this video, I'm going to try and put into context just how big the Earth really is. And I'll put it in a practical demonstration using this model globe to try and make it more understandable. Like how I find Brilliant.org's interactive animations make things much easier to understand. They have classes on hundreds of topics across math, science and computing, so anybody can expand their knowledge even further. The classes lay out the concept of topics and then quiz you on it as you go, and all the questions come with specific explanations, so even if you get it wrong, you're able to see why. I'm enjoying Brilliant so much that at the time of me recording this, my daily streak is now up to 310 consecutive days. So why not see if you'd enjoy it as much as I am by taking a 30-day free trial through my link brilliant.org forward slash Dave McKeegan, and the first 200 people to do so can get 20% off an annual subscription. This globe is 30 centimeters in diameter, and it has a scale of 1 to 42 million. So every one centimetre on this globe equals 42 million centimetres in reality. So that is 420 kilometres or 260 miles per centimetre. To scale, that would make the moon a little over 8 centimetres in diameter, which is slightly larger than a baseball, and 230,000 miles away is 370,000 kilometres, so 370 million metres, divided by 420 million would put it almost 9 metres away from the model globe. A 6-foot person at a scale of 1 to 42 million would be 0 0.00004 millimetres tall. That's equal to 40 nanometers. A strand of DNA is 2.5 nanometers wide. So a 6-foot person on this model globe could be represented by a stack of 16 strands of DNA lay on top of each other. Hell, a bacteria is 2.5 micrometers long. At the scale of 1 to 42 million, that represents 105 meters on the globe. So a single bacteria on this globe stood on its end would represent a 30-story tower block. Now, I appreciate those are still quite hard to visualize, so let's expand it further. The average cruising altitude of a commercial aircraft is 35,000 feet, or about 10,600 meters. Scaled down to 1 42 millionth, that is a quarter of a millimeter. This pin is only half a millimeter in diameter. So laying this pin on the model globe, a commercial airliner would be cruising through the middle of it. Concorde would not have even got above it. Half a millimeter to that scale equals 69,000 feet. Felix Baumgartner's famous Red Bull skydive was a jump from 127,852 feet, or 38,969 meters. Even that doesn't reach a full millimeter to scale on this globe. It's equal to 0.93 millimeters. It also happens to be near enough the exact same height that Mr. Sensible's Mage 2 balloon reached a few years back. So as you can see, those sorts of high altitudes in relation to the size of the Earth aren't actually that high at all. Even the ISS isn't really that far away. Its orbital distance varies, but on average it's around 408 kilometers or 253 miles above the Earth. At this scale, that is equal to 9.7 millimeters, or almost one centimeter above the globe. 
Now, I've seen many people query the ISS. Why can't you see vast distances across the globe from orbit? And this is basically why. Because relatively speaking, the ISS orbit is actually very close to Earth, so its line of sight to the horizon isn't really that far compared to the huge size of the globe. But I wanted to put this into better context for everyone, so I set about a little project to produce this first-person view of an orbit around this model globe. Now, because of how much everything is scaled down, the working distances between the globe surface and the camera lens are far too close for most lenses to be able to focus, and most macro lenses, which are designed for close focusing, have quite long focal lengths in order to get tight in shots of objects. But to reproduce the kind of view that you'd see in person from orbit requires a wide angle macro lens. Although this would then still produce a problem of getting the lens close enough to the globe on an angle in order to see towards the horizon, but without the camera body itself crashing into the globe. However, there is a niche type of lens that gets around these problems called a periscope lens, which is essentially a wide angle macro lens, but with a very long narrow barrel. This keeps the front optics of the lens far away from the camera body. So I reached out to my friends over at Pergear, who sell a huge range of camera equipment and accessories, and that includes these periscope lenses. And they very kindly sent me one for the purpose of doing this project. So a huge thank you to Pergear, and if anybody is in need of any camera equipment or accessories, I can highly recommend checking them out. They've been brilliant with me over the past few years. I'll leave a link to their website in the description down below. So armed with the periscope lens that would allow me to get a close-up shot of the Earth, I then needed a method of getting the camera to rotate around the globe consistently. So hand holding the camera was out of the question. And what I ended up doing was taking the product turntable that I've used for reviews in the past, screwing a wooden block to it with a 3 8 screw thread coming through the center, and that allowed me to attach my tripod center column to it. Now this center column is quite unusual in that it is two center columns, one inside the other. So I was able to rotate the inner column through 90 degrees, which would then allow me to have the camera pointing straight up towards the ceiling, rotating in a circle at whatever distance from the center that I needed just by sliding the center column back and forth. And thanks to the 90 degree turn on the end of the lens and the fact that you can rotate the barrel end to point in wherever you need it, I was able to get the lens circling around the globe, which I had hanging from a bracket above it. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to get it exactly perfect in that the screw for the center column wasn't perfectly in the middle of the turntable, so the camera doesn't stay an exact consistent distance from the globe, and the head of this lens is about three centimeters wide. So even if I could get it a constant distance above the globe, the closest distance at best that I could get would still be slightly more than the scaled altitude of the ISS, but it's close enough to give a pretty good representation. And to finish it off, I set up a 300 watt video light across the room with a snoot on the end of it to produce a very narrow beam of light to illuminate one side of the globe. So you can see a first person view in orbit around the model globe, how it would look transitioning between day and night. Although you do unfortunately get the shadow of the lens barrel casting on the earth as it heads towards sunset, but overall, it was a fun little project, and I, I don't even think I'm finished with it yet, because this setup has the camera orbiting around the equator, and the Earth isn't moving, neither of which truly reflect the ISS. So I might revisit this in the future if I can come up with a method of having the globe rotating slowly and on a tilt in order to accurately reproduce the orbital path of the ISS. But either way, this just shows that even from an altitude higher than the ISS, the amount of the Earth's surface that could actually be seen at any one time is actually relatively small. And flat Earthers often talk about these ideas of vast oceans and atmospheres clinging to a spinning globe. Mount Everest is the highest point on Earth. It's 8,849 meters tall. That is below the 10,000 meters cruising altitude of commercial aircraft that we've already covered. 
To scale on this globe, Mount Everest is only one fifth of a millimeter tall. At that height, the atmosphere is already so thin that we struggle to breathe without breathing equipment. The extra 0.04 millimeters increase up to the height of airliners, the air is unbreathable. The breathable part of the atmosphere of Earth is more like a thin film covering the surface. And it's similar with oceans. The average depth of the ocean around the world is 3,682 meters, or 12,080 feet. To scale on this globe, that's less than 0.09 millimeters, so less than one-tenth of a millimeter for the average ocean depth. The deepest point on Earth is the Challenger Deep in the Mariana Trench, reaching 10,920 meters, or 35,827 feet below sea level. Basically, the height of a commercial airliner, but down. So again, to scale, that is half the width of this pin under the surface is the deepest point on Earth. If you were to park Mount Everest on the island of Guam, so it was right next to Challenger Deep, from the deepest point in the ocean to the highest peak on Earth, the biggest variation in the layout of the Earth's surface is less than the width of this pin. It's like when flat earthers argue that we see further than they think we should because they dismiss atmospheric refraction because they think it's some magical attempt to explain away things, possibly due to the simplified diagrams that we see like this that suggest massive atmospheres and huge bends in light. But on the scale of this globe, a tiny shift in light would produce a noticeable effect in terms of the distance across Earth. So as much as we think about the deep depths of the ocean and soaring high in the sky above Earth, and we see all of those completely out of proportion diagrams that try to explain things simply, when we put it all into the scale of the Earth, it's actually a very different picture. So that's going to be it for today. As always, feel free to leave your thoughts in the comments down below. If you enjoyed this video and you haven't already done so, then please consider hitting the like and subscribe buttons, and hopefully we'll see you in the next video.